I think aside from the Chumash, the five books of Moses, the Haggadah has attracted more commentaries than any other piece of Jewish literature. It is much beloved. It's the centerpiece of one of the most um, inspiring Jewish performances, the Seder. Many people who have lost other connections to the Jewish tradition, the Jewish practice, do perform a, a, a Seder. And therefore, the text of the Haggadah has become familiar to people, and also uh, people regard it with a certain amount of reverence. Uh, there's really an unlimited amount of material from every different possible angle. And I have my idiosyncratic interests, some in logic, some in philosophy, some in Kabbalah, and I'll share with you some insights coming from all of those realms. And, uh, certainly what I'm saying is not meant to be complete or exhaustive. You could spend the rest of your lifetime just studying the Haggadah and you wouldn't be bored. Um, take a look on page 19. Here you have a list of the 15 stages of the Haggadah. Just a summary. I mean, just a list, a list of topics in order. Some people, as part of their performance of the Seder, sing the list. We do. The English skips over one peculiarity in the language. Literally, it starts Kadesh Urchatz. The Vav Ur in the Urchatz means and. So if I would translate the list of 15, it would go like this. Kadesh and Rechatz, Karpas, Yachas, Magitz, Rachza, Motzi, Matzah, Boruch, Koruch, Shechon, Aruch, Sovon, Boruch, Hal, Nirza. In other words, you have 15 items, and the list goes 1 and 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. The careful reader will ask, why is there an and before 2? Just before 2, and all the rest are strung out without ands. The English translator didn't preserve the ant, so you can't get that from the English. But one should ask that question. I see here a hint to a famous theme in Jewish thinking, a theme that has a certain amount of discussion and debate. There are two ways to make progress, spiritual progress, and I would say even progress in any area. One is to increase your already present abilities, your already present successes, and make them superior. And the other is to face failures, disabilities, and try to remove them. To strengthen the positive and eliminate the negative. Both are necessary if you're doing sports, and there's certain things you do wrong, you've got to correct them. Even the things you do right, you could do better. And so it is with speaking a language, or riding a bike, or anything else in life. How do you proceed? What do you do first? Do you start by eliminating the negative and then turn to strengthening the positive, or vice versa? There's a famous verse in Psalms, written by King David, which gives one perspective on this issue, and that is, Sur meirav v'aseitov. Turn away from evil and do good. There is black and white. First, Rid yourself of the negative, and then do good. Still, there are those who think that the opposite is the correct order. Start by emphasizing the good, and then face the negative and try to eliminate it. But how could they do that if there is an explicit verse in Psalms which says the opposite? Well, first of all, let's take a look here in what we just read. Kadesh, sanctify. And wash. Wash means washing off what's dirt, washing off what's bad. And here the list has sanctify first, which means to emphasize and strengthen the positive, and then wash off, which means to take off the negative. And here you have an and, which joins the two of them. It's not just the first two items in the list. And there are no ands anywhere else on the list. Similarly, in the Shemon Esrei, um, we have, in the, in the bracha that recommends uh, doing tshuva, Hashivenu Hashem l'sorosecha v'korvenu l'makim l'abarosecha v'achazenu b'shuva shlema l'fenecha. 
bring us back, Hashem, to your Torah, draw us close to your service, and enable us to do complete repentance. Now, repentance is the strategy for taking off the negative. Bring us close to your Torah and return us to your Torah, bring us close to your service, is strengthening the positive. And strengthening the positive comes first. So those, I'm speaking now for the Hasidic movement, of which I am a proud member, those say, start by strengthening the positive and only afterwards face the negative and try to eliminate it. Ah, but what about King David? What about King David's psalm? So the explanation there is this. Yes, King David put eliminating the negative before uh, strengthening the positive. But who says he's describing steps one and two of a process? Maybe not. Maybe it's a three-stage process, and King David is describing steps two and three. Then the process works like this. First, emphasize the positive, strengthen the positive. Use the strength you gain from adding to the positive to turn and address the negative and eliminate it. And then turn back, step three, and do the positive again even better. And the explanation of it is this. What you do, you do with all of you. You are a single, integrated agent. Whatever you have in you participates in everything you do. If you are like most people, you're a mixture of good and bad. That means when you do even good, the good isn't perfect, because the bad in you participates in the action of the good. All right. The three-stage process recommends do something good. Yes, the bad in you will participate. It will make it incomplete. It will make it blemished. But on the whole, it's good. Do something good. Use that to strengthen the good side. Once you've strengthened the good side, then turn and face the negative. Eliminate the negative and then go back and do a purified good. What King David is recommending is the strategy for achieving a better good. That's steps two and three. It doesn't tell you how to start. And here, Lagoda seems to be telling you how to start. Start by emphasizing the positive and only then turn to eliminate the negative. This is based on very sound psychology. After all, um, it's much, much easier to set yourself to improve what you already do well than to try to face something that, at which you're a failure. To face the failure means to remind yourself that you're a failure. People would rather avoid that. If I haven't told the way to start making progress is to face my failures, I'm likely to put it off for next month or next year or next decade. If I'm told that the way to, make imp uh, to improve myself is by strengthening my successes, I'm likely to be inclined to do that because there I feel good about myself. I'm reinforcing a positive self-image, which the Hasidic movement felt was fundamental to spiritual success. So that's the first step. And then with the improved purity and with the inertia of forward motion of improving oneself, turn to the negative, and then finally achieve a superior positive. That's something which is hidden there. Um, I can guarantee this. If you say it to Seder, um, no one will have heard it before except someone who has heard my recorded shurim on the Nagara. That's something which occurred to me. Okay, next page, 21. This is Kiddush. Now, this year it's Friday night, but I'm going to do the parts that deal with, with the holiday. Again, just skimming the surface, the bottom paragraph. Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all nations, exalted us above all tongues, meaning languages, and sanctified us with his commandments. Now, first of all, notice the sanctified us with his commandments comes third. That means choosing us and exalting us is not based on the fact that we perform the commandments. The picture here is not the Jewish people are performing the commandments. The commandments are central and important. They improve the world, everything else. And that's why God has invested in the Jewish people. That's wrong. On the contrary, if anything, there were preconditions to choosing us to perform the commandments. And at least two of them are mentioned here. So it's important to figure out what they mean. Chosen us from all nations means that this nation is especially suited to the challenge of performing the mitzvahs and completing the perfection of the world. 
How did that happen? Now, I want to give you the perspective of Rehosh Shechem Lutzato in the way of God, part one, chapters four and five, because this is very fundamental to an issue that bothers Jews, probably mostly because it bothers non-Jews and they attack Jews on that basis. What is the idea of a chosen people? Does setting yourself up as a chosen people mean you're superior? Aren't you attributing to yourself some kind of superiority over other people? And what kind of God is it that doesn't treat all of mankind equally, but chooses one group and sets them up as superior to another group? Sata says something here absolutely fundamental. The idea that humanity is split into two groups, an upper group into a lower group, is something which God never wanted. God worked hard to try to avoid. And it is only because he was rebuffed four and a half times in a row that we ended up with a two-tiered humanity. Let's see. Let's consider God's creation in the Garden of Eden. You had two people. Was there an upper group and a lower group? Superior group and inferior group? Obviously not. And had they succeeded in meeting the challenge that was addressed to them, that would have been the end of human history, the end of choosing, the end of testing. From there, it would have been a straight route into the world to come, and there would not have been two levels of humanity. Okay, they failed, and they were expelled. Then the world was open for the opportunity to achieve a status related to the Garden of Eden reality so as to be able to repair the world. That was open to everyone equally, says the Ramchal. Abraham did it. Everyone could have done it. There was no barrier. So that was God's second chance, to reach everyone equally. And of course, only Abraham did it. Abraham did it at the time of the separation of the nations. The nation was separated, and he created that as a reality, at least as a potential, for his descendants. Subsequently, any other group could have joined the Jewish nation, detached themselves from their, their, the nations that were established at that time, and the whole of humanity could have done so. There were no barriers. For a short period of time, the times of Abraham and Isaac, up until the time Jacob went down to Egypt, there were tens of thousands who did. But they got lost through time, and only the Jewish nation remained. That was the third shot. The fourth shot, before God gave the, uh, the Torah at Sinai, he offered the Torah to us two days before, no lightning, no thunder, no sound of the shofar, no ground trembling under their feet. This was the fourth of, um, the fourth of Sivan, not the day of the revelation. Moses came and said to us, do you want God's Torah or not? Simultaneously with all the nations of the world, their leaders, whoever they were, gave the same message to their populations. <coughs> the Creator is giving a Torah to the world. Do you want to join the Jewish people? Not in place of, not in place of, but to join the Jewish people in accepting the Torah of the Creator of the world. It was a fourth chance for everyone to be in equally. And of course, every other nation said no. And therefore we got it. That's the fourth shot. I said four and a half because the door is open for conversion and the ideal re uh, resolution of the human condition would be for all non-Jews to convert to become Jews. All of mankind has said no four and a half times consistently. So God is left with a two-tiered humanity. But that was not his choice. And by the way, if you look carefully in certain svarim, the original tier, let's say, Adam and Chava in the Garden of Eden, that was what we today call the Jewish people. The reality of man is what Judaism carries. The rest of the world carries something which isn't fully human. The symptom of it is that we have 613 commandments. Adam and Chava in the Garden, in the garden of Eden with the tree of knowledge of good and evil, says the Zohar, that reality and that commandment contained the whole Content of the 613 commandments. That's what's necessary to rectify the world as a whole. That's the definition of mankind. Those who didn't recover from the expulsion from the Garden of Eden, they didn't recover from it. They didn't grab the opportunity to relate to it by putting themselves in a position of Abraham or the Jewish people. They have not got 
the full measure of humanity. Yes, there is an upper and lower tier. There is, but it's only because that's what they've chosen. They've chosen not to respond to God's invitation four and a half times. Now, those people who are worried about elites, and they think of the caste system in India, with the four castes, and the nobility in Europe, medieval in Europe, now today, uh, titles of nobility are on sale, so rich Texan oilmen can become nobles of Great Britain by buying it. But there was a time when it was strictly hereditary, and they think of that as anti-democratic and uh, sin against equality and all the rest, and then they associate that with us. Association is probably not accurate, because there, the identity of the group is based solely on birth. You're born into it, and there's nothing you can do to change your identification. Here, you can volunteer for the upper group. It's hard to see that that's viciously um, prejudiced and viciously um, uh, anti-equality if everyone is invited to join. At any rate, that's the first thing. God chose us from all the nations because, as some have said, we chose him. And because we chose him and we answered that invitation, we are the ones who are fit to bear the challenge of the commandments. Then it says, he exalts us above all tongues, above all languages. Now, if you studied language, the history of language in university, you've been taught that all languages are conventional. The fact that this is T-A-B-L-E, pronounced table, in English is absolutely arbitrary. It could have been called fox or blah, and it would have been just as reasonable, because languages are just made up, just accidental. They don't know that Hebrew is any different, and so therefore, they say that Hebrew is also a conventional language. But of course, that's not true. Hebrew is not a conventional language. The Hebrew language carries within it the essence of the reality. The letters, the vowel points, the sounds, the order, carry in it the essence of the reality. Um, sometimes, sometimes you can see that a little bit. Sometimes there's a hint to it in the structure. And most often, for those of us who don't know deep Kabbalah, it's not obvious to us. Um, in the fall, there's a mitzvah to sit in a sukkah. The word sukkah, basic word is spelled with a samach, a kaf, and a hay. There are th three acceptable structures for a sukkah. One is to have four walls, closed, entirely enclosed, like a samach. The other is to have three walls, like a kaf. And the other is to have an angle with an independent piece, like a hay. So the letters of the word sukkah depict the three acceptable structures for a sukkah. According to the Gaon of Vilna. We're coming up to Pesach now. Chametz and Matzah, right? Um, notice that Chametz is spelled Ches Mem Tzadi, and Matzah is spelled Mem Tzadi, Hey. So the only difference between Chametz and Matzah is the difference between a Ches and a Hey. Now let's see. Think of the shapes of the letters. What's the difference between a Ches and a Hey? Well, a Ches has three sides closed, and a Hey has an angle with a little bit standing on the side. Suppose that little bit were to grow, elevate, extend upwards, rise. Getting the hint? Rise? Hmm? Then that little bit would join the roof and become a ches. What is chametz? Chametz is flour and water that was allowed to rise, to ferment and expand. Matzah is flour and water that wasn't allowed to rise and extend. The hay and the ches depict, pictorially, they show the difference between chametz and matzah. These are just hints. Now, when the Torah says that God brought all the animals to Adam to see what he would call them, that means when he saw a dog and he, and, and he pronounced kaf, leth, lamed, beis, kelev. So if we knew how the letters have their reality, we'd be able to say, yes, of course, of course. That four-legged creature that barks is described by Kaf Lamed Beis, not arbitrarily, not accidentally, but that's what the letters describe. We'd be able to see that. Now, why is that important? 
It's important because a great deal of your thought is structured by the language you speak. Let me tell you something which a French linguist and philosopher said at the end of the 19th century. He said, we French are very fortunate because the French language is perfectly suited to human thought. For example, in French, you say the noun first and the adjective afterwards. That's because when people think, they think of an object and then they think of its qualities. That's what people think. So we Frenchmen have a tremendous advantage that our language reflects how you think. Imagine the poor crippled English whose language is backwards. The adjectives come first, the noun comes afterwards, and their language doesn't reflect the way they think. Their thinking and their speaking are crippled to one another. Of course, later thinkers point out that that's a little naive. Probably the language you are taught to speak as an infant influences the way you think. So because you were brought up to speak, fr speak French, you think object first and qualities afterwards. And if you're brought up to speak English, then you'll think qualities first and object afterwards. I won't say that's typical of the French. I won't say that. But at any rate, it makes a difference. The language you speak has an impact on the way you think. So if you speak a conventional language, then what you have is, at best, a human invention, which has all the strengths and weaknesses of a particular culture. If you have the language that's the basis of the world, that's a different matter. God bequeathed upon us the language with which the world was created. Here is just one symptom of the difference. What does shalom mean? If you'll take out your handy English dictionary, which is full of mistakes, shalom will be translated as peace. But that's a very inadequate translation because peace in English is a negative concept. Peace means the absence of disturbance, the absence of conflict. You can say, rightfully in English, the graveyard is very peaceful. You could never use shalom in Hebrew for the graveyard. Never. Shalom means complete. It means integrated. It means perfectly functional. Shalom is a positive concept. Peace is a negative concept. A person whose mind thinks in terms of peace is going to be led down a certain path of associations. A person whose mind thinks in terms of shalom is going to be led down a different set of associations. So the idea that we were chosen among, among all languages, that is to say because we have the Hebrew language, is a very significant idea. So you have our volunteering to respond to God's initiation to achieve that status that's relevant to the Garden of, Cre uh, the Garden of Eden, and the fact that our mental processes are formed by a language that's key to the creation. These are two preconditions to God's giving us the challenge of living up to the commandments. Are we together so far? Okay. Now it says here, he sanctified us with his commandments. What does that mean? And indeed, every time we perform a commandment, or almost every time, we say a blessing on performing the commandment, and we say, he sanctified us with his commandments. What does that mean? There are two explanations that you find in the literature. One is that when you perform a commandment, that creates a certain sanctity in the person. The commandments are inherently sanctified, and when you express that commandment in your action, in your mind, your will, and your action, that's redundant, mind, your will, and your physical performance, then uh, you acquire a certain sanctity for yourself. That's certainly true. There's another meaning, which in a way is more fundamental. And that is that when God gave us the commandments, he invested in us the sanctity that enables us to carry them out. Prior to performing the commandments, it's a precondition for performing the commandments. Both of them are true, and when we say those words, one should have them both in mind. Okay, I just want to comment on the very last line. I'm skipping a lot of stuff, obviously. Blessed are you, Hashem, who sanctifies... Now, when it's not Shabbos, we say Israel and the festifications. When it is Shabbos, we say the Sabbath, Israel and the festifications. So, the careful reader says, why is it that Israel is only mentioned on the festifications? Why isn't it that every Friday night we also say Israel and the Sabbath? And why is it that when you have a regular holiday without Shabbos, it's Israel first and the festifications second? When you put Shabbos in, Shabbos in come, goes in before, this, before Israel. 
Why is that the order? And this little piece of phraseology carries with it a gigantic uh, amount of, uh, of material, of which I'm going to just give you a little selection. The Gemara cites a fundamental difference between Shabbos and the holidays. There are many differences, but this is one. That Shabbos is established by God. Our job is only to live it appropriately, but it's his establishment from the creation of the world, which he established it on the first seventh day. And the world follows that pattern forever, and then he commanded us to perform that Shabbos which he sanctified and he created. Versus the holidays, the holidays are in great uh, measure created by us. Here's the most fundamental way. Um, we're coming to Pesach. Pesach is a date on the calendar, the 15th of Nisan. That's the first day of Pesach. How does a day get to be the 15th of Nisan? Well, the month starts. How does the month start? Well, originally, the month started because there were witnesses who came to the court and said they saw the new moon, and the new moon declared that, uh, the court declared that today's the first day of the month. I'm skipping over a gigantic discussion among the medievals, whether this is necessary or sufficient or whatever. So, the normal procedure is the witnesses come on Monday, and they say, last night we saw the new moon. So the court says, today is the first day of Nisan, beginning of the month. Two weeks later on Monday is the 15th, and that's when Pesach starts. But as a matter of fact, there is a law about establishing the new month about which there's no, dis no debate, and that is the court has the ability to override or act without witnesses. The witnesses do not determine what happens. So imagine the witnesses come and they say, we saw the new moon last night. The court has a prerogative to say, thank you so much. We appreciate your dedication. We're starting it tomorrow. We're not starting it today. Not interested. We have our reasons. We're starting it tomorrow. Or the court can say, no witnesses showed up. We're starting it anyway, without witnesses. Witnesses are neither necessary or sufficient. The court can, is free to operate against witnesses in both directions. You have the control to do it on your own, which means that the month is not an astronomical phenomenon. This carries gigantic dividends. The month is not an astronomical phenomenon. It's not determined by the moon. It's determined by the court. Normally, the court follows the moon, but it's not bound to do so. That means that, let's say, this year, when Pesach comes out, the first day of Pesach comes out on Shabbos, that's because two weeks before the month of Nisan began, and the month of Nisan began then because the court said so. It's because the court said so that the month begins at that time. That means which 24-hour period of history carries the sanctity of Pesach, is determined by the court, is determined by the Jewish people. The Jewish people make it so. And they could have made it otherwise. Unlike Shabbos, which is every seven days since the creation, rolling along without any contri contribution from the Jewish people. So, when you have a regular holiday, you say God sanctifies the Jewish people and the festivals. Because it's only through the Jewish people that the festival gets sanctified. On an ordinary Shabbos, Yes, Hashem sanctifies the Shabbos because it has nothing to do with us. Now, when they're combined, what I've told you already explains, but I'm going to give more of an explanation, already explains the order. God sanctifies the Shabbos independently, and then he sanctifies the Jewish people and the, the, the holidays because it's through the Jewish people that the holidays become sanctified. But there are those who want to see an additional implication here. Just, you have, God sanctifies A, B, and C. And we say, B sanctifies C. Right, what about A sanctifying B? They want to say that also. That by giving us the Shabbos, God also infused in us a certain sanctity. And through that, we are able to sanctify the holidays. The holidays, in a certain sense, are miniature Shabbosim. They're miniature Shabbos. They have prohibitions against activity. Just not all the ones that you have on Shabbos. Some of the holidays are called Shabbosom. Shabbosom can mean a miniature Shabbos, even though it's applied to Yom Kippur as well. Okay. At least the, the, the penalty there is not the same. It's reduced. 
So the three together can be understood. God sanctifies the Sabbath. Through the Sabbath, he sanctifies the Jewish people. And through the Jewish people, the holidays are sanctified. Then comes Magid. We're on page 25. There is, this opening is the only part of the, of the Haggadah, the official Haggadah that's in Aramaic. That's because it wasn't part of the official text of the Haggadah. It was declarations that were made by our ancestors living in the time of the temple. And they weren't made at night. They were made in the afternoon at various times. Um, but they're recorded because they were customary. This is the bread of... Now, almost everywhere, the Hebrew word is translated as affliction. I think this translation is a mistake. I think it's a significant mistake. Whether it's the word here in Aramaic, anya, or lechem oni in Hebrew, it's the same, same idea, same word. One in Hebrew, one in Aramaic. Oni means deprivation. Deprivation means I'm lacking something. Lacking my normal resources. Affliction means I'm in pain. Indeed, affliction means someone's putting me in pain. If a person has a stomachache, he doesn't normally call that an affliction. The word in Hebrew does not carry the connotation of pain. It simply means you're missing certain normal resources. Whether you are in pain or not, is, the word is non-committal. That's why when that word is used with respect to Yom Kippur, there's no mitzvah to cause yourself pain on Yom Kippur. Sleep on beds of nails or turn off the air conditioning so you'll sweat. There's no, there's no such mitzvah. Yom Kippur doesn't require pain. Yom Kippur is deprivation. No food, no, no, uh, no drink, no leather shoes, etc. But whether the deprivation is something which hurts you or whether it's something which is neutral or whether it's something that you exalt in, uh, now, how could you exalt in deprivation? I'll give you a really brutal example. There are sailboat races. There are even uh, races of, of foremaster uh, ships with gigantic sails and everything else. You imagine, these boats are up for the, for the race, the, the firing gun, and they start sailing out on the wind, and somebody comes riding out the motorboat and says, you guys are nuts. You're trying to get there fast? Watch me! And he opens the throttle, and he goes off at 50 knots, I said, what's the matter with you? What are you using sails for? Motorboats were invented 100 years ago. What would we say to him? He said, no. The goal is not to get there fastest. The goal is to get there fastest by sail. Because that requires a certain amount of intelligence, a certain amount of skill, craft, strategy. So having the motorboat doesn't mean that you are in a superior position. Having the motorboat means you don't know what the, what the exercise is. So being deprived of a motor doesn't mean that you're in pain or afflicted. You may choose that because that's where you want to show what you're able to do. So I, I think here the, the concept is the bread that we ate when we were lacking our normal resources. Now, have you gone to see how matzahs are baked? If you haven't gone, you should go. It's a real experience. It's unbelievable. From the minute the water hits the flour till the matzahs come out of the oven has to be less than 18 minutes, and in most places it's something like 12 or 13 minutes. That's a, it's assembly line production, and it's, it's, it's really unbelievable. Matzah can be made fast. Well, if you're working a whole day, slave labor, and you come home, you don't want to make challah. Challah, you have to make the dough, wait for the dough to rise, and punch it down and make it rise again. And then you have to carefully bake it in the oven. This, you make the dough, you slap it on the wall of the oven, and in a few minutes, it's finished. This was the bread that they ate when they were deprived of time and leisure and a class who spend all day just baking and so forth and so on. It was a bread of deprivation. But it's not, not I, I think affliction is the wrong uh, translation. As we will see, the bread will change its identity as we go through the Haggadah. A later portion gives it a different identity, and we'll have to deal with that, how the, how the bread sort of matures through the process of reciting the Haggadah. But here is the bread of deprivation. Whoever is hungry, let him come and eat. Whoever is needy, let him come and celebrate Passover, which in the Hebrew means join us on the Paschal sacrifice. Now, he can only do that if he's um, 
listed as one of the participants before the sacrifice is slaughtered. There, there has to be a list of participants before it's slaughtered. That's why I say this has to be in the afternoon. This can't be at night when you're going home and you're inviting people on the street and saying, come and join us. If we had the temple and we had the Paschal sacrifice, at night it's too late. You have to be assigned to a sacrifice in the afternoon before the actual slaughtering takes place. Now comes two sentences which depict Jewish people in exile. We'll qualify that or explain that in a moment. Now we are here. Next year, may we be in the land of Israel. Now we are slaves. Next year, may we be free men. It's important to realize that those are two independent, independent statements. Two independent statements. Neither one implies the other. Now we are here in Chicago, in London, in Johannesburg. Next year, we want to be there in Eretz Yisrael. Now we are slaves. Maybe not in Chicago. Maybe you aren't slaves in Chicago. And maybe you are slaves in the land of Israel under the Hellenists who took control of the country, who offered pigs in the temple. We were slaves in our own country. So being a slave is something that can happen anywhere, and being outside the land of Israel can happen even when you're not a slave. These are two independent requests, okay? Now, tell me, we are sitting here, Baruch Hashem, in Yerushalayim. We are going to make the Seder in Yerushalayim. How can we say, this year we are here, next year in the land of Israel? How can we say that? Shouldn't we skip that? No. Oh, it talks about, the, I mean, you, you could put that in to try to solve the problem, but it doesn't say that. Oh, who's the we? We are here. Next year in the land of Israel. The one inside this skin? My family? What about the majority of the Jewish people that are out? If I identify with the Jewish people as a whole, then we are outside the land of Israel. Many of us are. And my sitting here isn't complete because our brothers and sisters are, out, are external. So the we here is where the person identifies with the nation. As you'll see, that gesture of identifying with the nation will be very important as the text develops. But that, I think, is the most direct way to understand it. Okay? Now we come to one of the most famous and least understood pieces in the Haggadah. In many places, it's called the four questions. Those of you who don't know me, my strategy is always read it as literally and simplistically as you can. Don't use any imagination. See if it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, then, then we'll work on it and try to do something to understand it better. Let's imagine that you had here the title, The Four Questions. Now let's read through it. Why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we may eat chametz and matzah. This night, only matzah. On all other nights, we eat, many, we, we eat many vegetables. This night, we eat mora. Not only mora, that's a mistake. We eat mora. means bitter herbs. On all other nights, we do not dip even once. This night, twice. On all other nights, we eat either sitting or reclining. This night, we're all reclining. How do you feel about the title of four questions? Does this text give you four questions? It certainly does not. What does it give you? Two questions and one answer. One question. Oh, no, yeah, you got it backwards. One question and four answers. Why is this night different from all the nights? I'll tell you why it is. Here are four ways in which it's different. Open and shut. Why would anybody call this four questions? Very peculiar. Furthermore, the translation of the first sentence is incorrect. There's no why in the Hebrew. The first word in the Hebrew is ma. Ma means what? doesn't mean why. And the word ma sometimes doesn't mean what either. Jacob sleeps, and when he sleeps, he sees a ladder going up to heaven, and he sees angels going up and down the ladder, and God speaks to him, and when he wakes up in the morning, he says, Ma nora hamokaim hazeh. Ma awesome this place is. How would you translate Ma there, just gave you a hint. How awesome. Now, is it how awesome is this place 
or how awesome this place is? Is it a question or an exclamation? Is it, how awesome is this place? How many awesome this points should I give it? Out of 100, 92, 96? Is that what he's doing? Asking how awesome it is? Surely not. He's exclaiming how awesome this place is. And that is how you make an exclamation in biblical Hebrew. You start with a ma, and then you state a fact. And the ma means how great this is, how impressive this is. So the correct, I'm, I'm quoting the Barbanel now. So the correct translation of the first line is how different this night is from all other nights. Not a question, it's an exclamation. Then it gives four points of difference. Now, in Hebrew, the title that I told you, the four questions, is the Arba Kushiot. There's another word in Hebrew for a question, that's Sheila. There's a big difference between a Sheila and a Kushia. A Sheila is a question. I'm new to town. Where's City Hall? Where can I get stamps? I just don't know. That's a Sheila. A Kushia is a difficulty. It's an objection. What? That's the mayor walking down the street without an entourage? How come? Why isn't he followed by Secret Service? Why isn't he traveling in a Cadillac? That's a kushia. Something's wrong. Something's out of place. Something needs to be explained. It's called the Arba Kushiot. So there's got to be some difficulty here. The Barbanel says the following. Let's look at the symbolism of the four items mentioned in this passage. One is matzah. What is matzah? We just heard what matzah is. Matzah is a bread of deprivation. Bread we ate as slaves. This night we eat maror, bitter herbs, as a, rem a reminder of slavery. On other nights, we don't even dip once. That means to say it's not required to dip once. Tonight we dip twice. Listen, we're eating vegetables. We don't just eat vegetables. We have a dip in which we dip the vegetables so as to give them a certain flavor, a certain accompaniment. Who does that? Rich people. People who have enough resources for extra ordinary people who are just barely surviving as it was in ancient times. You can spend money on a dip for your vegetables. Reclining, they, they ate banquets on a reclining couch. You may have seen pictures of the Romans when, when they did this. That was typical. For a, a wealthy person who's celebrating and having a leisurely festive meal, that's the way he conducted himself. So the last two symbols, dipping and reclining, are symbols of freedom. Now, dear Barbanel says, let's think about designated days in the Jewish calendar. What kind of historical events do we commemorate? There are two kinds. We commemorate great victories, great successes, great salvations. The giving of the Torah at Sinai on Shavuos. The fact that God provided us in wandering in the desert for, with uh, the clouds of glory, which is what Sukkot is about. Hanukkah, Purim, we celebrate great successes. We also commemorate great failures and destructions. The, temp the destruction of the temple, the besieging of Jerusalem, the murder of uh, Gedali ben Achika, various terrible events that took place. And we commemorate them with fasting and with other... When a person gets married, uh, they put ashes on the forehead of the chassan to remind them of the destruction of the temple. But each historical reference is one-dimensional. Either you are celebrating a great victory and salvation on the one hand, or you're commemorating a disaster. Here, you have symbols of both types. What is going on? That's the question of the Haggadah. What is going on? You have symbols of slavery, and you have symbols of freedom. What is the nature of this commemoration? What is the theme of the commemoration? Now, I will agree, that doesn't fully explain four kushiot, it's really a single four-part kushia. Okay, maybe that much I'll have to leave dangling. But at least I have a difficulty, and we see why the, the exclamation starts it. The exclamation is, how different this night is from all other nights, because, says the Abarbanel, all other nights, all other commemorations are one-dimensional. Only this one is two-dimensional. By the way, I should have said this at the beginning, but let's put this in now. Could this be questions of a child, a young child,
who doesn't remember from last year, maybe he's four. Remember from last year, he's three. Exactly what's going on and why it's going on. He's asking questions, innocently asking questions about what he sees and what interests him. Is that a possible way to explain the content of these questions? No, it's not possible. Why not? Why not? What is there in these questions which couldn't be asked by a four-year-old who doesn't remember from last year what's going on? Definition. Say again? Definition. Memory. No, again, he had, doesn't have memory, and he sees things happening, and he's asking about them. That can't be the right shot. Cannot be. Why not? Well, boys and girls, some of them haven't happened yet. Some of them haven't happened yet. Dipped twice, only had one dip so far. Only matzah? Who said so? Maybe after you eat the matzah, there'll be a birthday cake. Who knows? You know, pizza, lasagna. Who told you no? If you're a four-year-old and don't remember from last year, how do you know those things are going to happen? Furthermore, on the previous page, what I skipped, there are peculiar events that take place before this, which an alert child should ask about. After all, you made kiddush. You didn't, you didn't go and wash and have bread or matzah. No, you took a piece of celery or potato and you dipped it in salt water and made a blessing and ate it. That's weird. That never happens. And a four-year-old will say, hey, Abba, what's going on? We never do that. Doesn't remember from last year. So it can't be the question of a young child who observes things going on and is just interested in getting explanations. That supports, I think, what the Barbanel is doing. There's a sophisticated question here. It's not a question for, for young children. Question, he says it's a fourfold uh, question. Two symbols of slavery, two symbols of freedom. And the question is, what kind of commemoration is this? Okay. I've given you, I hope, enough. Let's read the next sentence and see if you can formulate for me in one or two words the answer to the question. The next sentence on page 27 is, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt and Hashem took us out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. How does that answer the exclamation? How does that answer what the uniqueness of this night is having two symbols of slavery and two symbols of freedom? How does that answer the question? What does this night symbolize? From slavery to freedom. It symbolizes the transition from the one to the other. That's what it symbolizes. That's what it commemorates. That's why this night has one leg planted on the slavery side and one leg planted on the freedom side. And it celebrates the transition from one to the other. That's what's going on. That's why the two slavery symbols come first in the questions. And the two freedom symbols come second. And as you'll see, this is not only an introduction to the quality of the night, Lady Barbanel explains it, but it is an introduction to the performance of the Haggadah altogether. Could we have that door closed, please? Thank you. Um, the, the whole performance of the Haggadah is to experience a transition from slavery to freedom, as we will see um, uh, tomorrow or the next day. We gather so far? Okay, now, an exercise in careful reading. Let's start again, the first full paragraph on page 27. I'm going to read two sentences together. Watch and see whether they're really consistent. Again, remember what I told you before. I read things simplistically, no imagination, no commentaries in mind, literally straightforward and see whether they make sense. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and Hashem our God took us out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Had not the Holy One, blessed be He, taken our fathers out from Egypt, then we, our children and children's children, would have been, not remained, there's no remained in the Hebrew, would have been subservient to Pharaoh in Egypt. Are those two sentences consistent? No, they are not. No, they are not. They are strictly contradictory. Let's try it again. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, I remember the lashes on my back. 
I remember starving. I remember slapping the food again, the, the, the dough against the oven and eating those crackers, you know. And Hashem took us out. Second sentence. Had not the Holy Blessed be taken our fathers out from Egypt, then we and our children, children, children would have been subservient. But he did. He did take our fathers out. And since he took our fathers out, then we were not slaves in Egypt. So were we slaves in Egypt or weren't we slaves in Egypt? The two sentences on the surface are straight, strictly contradictory. The first says we were slaves. And the second says we, aren't, we, aren't, we weren't slaves. Now, here on this page with these two sentences, there's an easy way out. And I already hinted it to you about 17 minutes ago. All right, that's a joke. I don't remember how many minutes it was. Right? What's the easy way out? Say it. Say it out. With the right. The we in the first sentence means the Jewish people. Not you and I as individuals, but the Jewish people. Just like we are in exile, even though I'm going to sit and you're going to sit in Yerushalayim to make the Seder, but we, the Jewish people, is in exile. So here, too, the Jewish people was in, uh, were slaves in Egypt. Sometimes when I speak to uh, uh, British people who are a little too proud, I say, just remember that we won the Revolutionary War and you lost it, you know, with your red coats trained and everything else. We pummeled you, you know, we slaughtered you. Uh, excuse me, did you, David Gottlieb, shoot bullets at, at English soldiers? Certainly not. We means the Americans. The Americans uh, were victorious over the, over, the, over the British. Here you can say, we the Jewish people were slaves and... As individuals, God took our fathers out, and therefore we as individuals didn't suffer slavery. However, when we get to page 45, we'll see the solution is not so simple. Over there, it says explicitly that we as individuals were slaves in Egypt, and that we'll have to deal with when we get there. Now, I realize now that Milch is supposed to be at quarter to four. Wow.